spectacular mountains, very high, beautiful, they're good. We can go now. I mean, it's a pile of rocks all this way. Just and well. Oh. Oh. <sighs> Hello and welcome to this episode of the Campaign Creator Series. My name is Guy and today, of course, we're looking at deep time. Deep time. When you drop the beat down low, deep time. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, not at all. This video, of course, sponsored by World Anvil, worldanvil.com. If you are creating Deep Time, that's the website to do it on. So what is Deep Time? Well, it's the time before, the before. The stuff that's in your adventures, that's in your writing, that's in your stories that happened millennia or decades or centuries or eons ago that doesn't seem to have any relevance whatsoever to the story. And as a matter of fact, it's more interesting when it doesn't have any relevance necessarily, when it is just for flavor. But there's a way in which we need to go about doing this to make it interesting for more than just ourselves. One of the biggest risks we run as storytellers is when we create deep time stuff, when we create things from five or six or seven hundred years ago or further, the things that we risk, the issues that come up, are things like we've spent hours creating this stuff and we think, we think everybody else wants to know about them too, when in actual fact they usually don't. So this is something that we have to be very cognizant of as creators, is that this is background stuff and when people don't see it, but there is, it's still there, it still has a, a presence, that's when it works. When people see it, suddenly it's invasive, it's a chore, it's something that they have to look at. So we're going to look at the before, we're going to look at the implications, and we're going to look at the use. So all of this kind of stuff is hopefully going to help you to create a deep time that resonates with your narrative, that helps enhance your story, but that doesn't get in the way. So when we talk about the before, what happened before? Why is this important? What is this going to do for us? We talk broad strokes. By broad strokes, I mean there was a before when we talk about, let's say, for example, the ancient Egyptians. They were around for a couple thousand years, a couple thousand years ago, and they had lots of gods and they built pyramids and stuff. It's broad strokes. What was the average day-to-day -day activity of an, a resident who lived in, say, Thebes, for example? I don't know, and nobody cares. It shouldn't have an impact on the day-to-day -day narrative that you are telling in the present. Something that happened thousands of years ago really shouldn't happen. Of course, a major cataclysmic moment where the priests of Egypt, say, for example, sent the Nile flowing in the opposite direction to flood out Ethiopia, or Nubia as it would have been called back then, that's a different story altogether. That is something that we would know about. But again, it's broad strokes. It's designed to enhance your narrative. So, for example, if we look at Manchu Picchu here behind me, it enhances our narrative of this amazing, amazing, civilization that happened before, civilization that we know very little about in context in terms of what we would like to know. All of the little details is what really fascinates archaeologists and anthropologists, but we don't have access to the information. It enhances our narrative. It doesn't get in the way of it. And that is something that you have to be absolutely clear on, is that whatever you're creating in terms of deep time, it's there to enhance. It's not there to get in the way. Now, you can also have fun with deep time. Deep time allows us to do some incredible things. Specifically, when you look at, say, Machu Picchu, or you look at, say, the pyramids of Egypt, or at Angkor Wat, let's go all over the world. When you look at these remarkable structures that were built by these civilizations, they're epic in nature. And they don't often, we don't often anyway, look at them and go, well, we've done similar stuff in the modern age. We've done bigger and better stuff in the modern age, but it isn't seen as being this major milestone for the nation. But they also had some really 
weird things as well. Uh, the idea that Pharaoh was a god and that all food was centralized and dispersed to the populations. There was no currency. That's something that's interesting. That's something that's fun. Something that you could possibly drop in there. On the other hand, rumors of a city of gold sent explorers running all over South America, Central America, and parts of Southern North America, trying to find this fabled land, the city made entirely out of gold, El Dorado. But, of course, did it exist, did it not exist, we don't know. So you can have fun with deep time, because generally speaking, it's part of the myths and legends that your world will have uh, as part of its general narrative space. And you can, you can really just... Oh, there's a giant statue of a head in the middle of the field. The players might go, oh, well, we go over and explore that. What is it? It's a head. Giant head. And if you dig down, it has a neck. This is a truly titanic statue. It probably stands, you would estimate, maybe 300 feet from the ground all the way up. It is a giant statue of a man who has three eyes. One eye on either side of the skull and one right in the center. The players go, well, where did it come from? What, 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 you know, what is the significance? Oh, it's old. It's really old. It's from the civilization known as Key. Civilization known as Key, said the players. What is that? Oh, give me some history checks. No, it's too old. None of you know about it. It's a moment. It flavors your lands. It gives the players insight that there's something more out there. There is an opportunity for them to do something. We're going to get to that a little bit later on. But it just it allows you to have fun. Why is there a giant head? Why do they build giant heads? Who knows? Easter Island, giant heads. Why? There's lots of theories that have been postulated as to why. Actual answer? We don't know. No one bothered to write it down. We made the giant heads because we felt that we really needed to enhance the local uh, geography by cutting down all of the trees so we can transport these heads, which ultimately led us to uh, start cannibalism, uh, which was a very fun uh, moment. And I, anyway, whatever. I like to include my players. I like my players when they create their characters to say, OK, cool, this is your character. Give me a little bit of ancient history. Talk about your race. Give me your race's ancient history. And they go, what? Okay, yeah, yeah. Let me know what your players think. Uh, what, what, what is your character? You're playing a tiefling. Okay, sure. What were the tieflings like a thousand years ago? And the players go, that's your job. Yeah, sure. Sure, it's my job. And I'm asking you a question about what were tieflings like a thousand years ago. Don't you know your race? Don't you know the history of your people? Do you not sing their song? Those are the kind of questions that you can throw at your players and then listen. Sometimes they might give you rubbish. Oh, the Tieflings are a spacefaring nation who decided to land on the planet. Well, OK, but perhaps they were an astral plane traveling nation that got stuck on Earth. Now we can start to build in some deep time history around that. That sparks your imagination. It lets you drop in a little bit of something and then you can move on. But broad strokes is your friend. Don't go too far. Then look at the implications of what that does when you add it into your world. So that giant head that's 300 foot tall. If you said that that was made out of gold, that would suddenly have a massive implication on your world. People would be mining these statues for the gold. If the gold had been infused with dark spirits that were now starting to be expressed as the miners dug them out and the spirits were being released and then inhabiting the bodies of the dead, well, now suddenly we have an entire adventure based on this deep time concept that you had put in there with just that giant head. We need to then look at what are our expectations. Our expectations of this giant head culture that have three eyes are that perhaps there are aliens out there that have three eyes, or perhaps that the sculptor was being expressive of our two actual eyes of vision and then our mind's eye. So perhaps the culture was an artistic culture. So there's lots of artworks that would be buried underneath the statue. What's at the bottom of the statue, you have to ask yourself? Well, that leads us to an adventure, does it not? It leads us down. You dig down to the base of the statue and there's a crypt. There's a tomb. There's an art gallery. Uh, whatever fits, whatever is appropriate, you are now using this deep time to create something more. So it creates a little bit of an adventure. Not every piece of deep time needs to lead to an adventure, though. I need to make a very, very important point there. Not every piece of a relic, not every artifact needs to lead there. But if it comes from somewhere, it should have something available with it. The characters find some ancient pottery that's done by the ancient, ancient kingdom of Exhalabim. And Exhalabim is no longer, it was destroyed a millennia ago by a demon horde, but this pottery might be worth something. Okay, they want to try and sell it. 
Does the adventure mean that they go back to Al Salabim or Bim, whatever the whatever this country was called, whatever this nation was called? No, it doesn't. It means that perhaps they have to try and find a collector of this rare antiquity and then try and sell it to them. So the adventure doesn't necessarily need to be linked directly to it. So there doesn't have to be a crypt underneath Manchu Peach. It could be that the object is found or that there is a, an actual layout of the site which could indicate a map leading to somewhere else. So it's a modern adventure in terms of timing. It's a modern timing, even if you're in a fantasy world, you get what I mean. The adventure doesn't have to be related specifically to the deep time. It could be the result of it being from deep time. What is its now? What is its value? So we've got to look at those the adventures, what's available, what do we want our players to do? What sort of journey do we want them to go on? And if there isn't something, if there is no, if there's no journey attached, the expectation management becomes important. That's when the news then say it's so far lost in history that you just don't know where it comes from. And when you ask people, oh, no, I can't say I recall. However, and this is the most important point as far as I'm concerned, is the use of of these deep time artifacts that you are dropping in, whether it's a statue, whether it's an old road, whether it's a piece of pottery, whether it's a phrase, whether it's a sword, it doesn't matter. If there are no plot hooks attached, if there is nothing, if it is purely layering of your world, then you need to make that very clear to the players when they encounter this stuff. And don't do it in terms of, okay, here's a relic uh, from the ancient past. Um, it has nothing about it that you can use it for in anything in any way. It's just to show you how good my world building is. We're not talking about that. When they get, when they find, let's say they find a brass goblet from the ancient civilization of Et. And they take it to a trader and the trader says, oh, this is from the ancient kingdom of Et. Very rare, these kinds of things. I'll give you 25 silver for it. It's rare, but no one really likes it. That stops the journey right away. If you take it to a, a librarian, oh, yeah, the old empire of Et. Now, these things pop up all the time. Very common. Now, you might find someone who might give you, say, four silver for it. They'll melt it down and turn it into something else, something more useful. So the layering in terms of this is just a dead end and it's some flavoring needs to be very clearly indicated. Whereas if it's a plot hook, that very same goblet. Oh, do you see these inscriptions here? They're written in old etis. I don't know of anyone who speaks that now. Uh, there was a book once. There's a library not far from here. Um, just on the other side of the river. It's uh, run by a rather eccentric fellow. But they might be able to help you read that. I believe this goblet might be of value, but I can't tell you what it is. That's an excellent plot hook for the players to suddenly go, ah, oh, OK, let's go to the library. The library, of course, is infested with undead or it's being ransacked or and suddenly your adventure plays out. And what's written on that mug is that whomsoever drinketh from this mug, say, gains a certain amount of hit points back or uh, gains knowledge or that the mug leads to a full set. And when you have a full set, when you entertain people, they're more likely to listen to what you're saying. They're more malleable to suggestion if they drink from the cup whatever however you want to do it but if it's a plot hook make sure that it is obviously a plot hook if it is just layering make sure that it is just layering so that your players don't start chasing these things what to do if they do epicness that's what you do epicness should be your byword when you are running games regardless of whether it's deep time or whether it's um a modern artifact, if it's something that, that, that has been created now, if the answer is epicness, then that's what it should be. So if the players have got this thing and you've tried your darndest, no, it, it really is. It's just, it, it, I, I can't tell you, folk, more. It's just a silver goblet from the city of Et, which burned to the ground three million years ago. No one knows anything about it. They're not collectible. No one likes them. I'll give you three silver for it because I've got to melt it down. There really is nothing. Even if you've done all of that and your player's going, no, there's got to be something to this goblet. I, I want to find out more about the civilization of Et. Huh. What a blessing. If the character wants to know more, your deep time has now suddenly become incredibly valuable to them, which is ultimately where you wanted it to be in the first place. So even if it's something that you have decided this has got nothing to do with anything, this is just layering, this is just for fun, and the player now wants to explore it more, Epicness is your answer. So as a matter of fact, 
it now does and you can link it in the back of your mind just improvise as the characters start to go on this and then once the session is over go and plan out in full how you can then use this to then drive it into the adventure to turn the entire thing into an adventure and your deep time has moved from being deep time flavor to suddenly adventure generation which i ultimately think is always something that should be on the cards for every type of thing because it makes your life as the game master your life as the narrator the story teller so much easier anyway those are my thoughts on deep time for those of you that have stuck around to the bitter end we've got some bonus stuff to talk about now when we are talking deep time when we're talking about the concept of what 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 why have deep time why have deep time the idea is it allows you to create different spaces so if the world the characters are currently in is a traditional fantasy world or a traditional science fiction world take for example star trek they use deep time once or twice but not very often because okay no let me let me rephrase that they use it all the time when they time travel they go into deep time but that's to explore different sort of spaces and things you can apply the same thing in your game so if the current age is dark and grim and there's lots of battle going on and there's lots of fighting and the pcs are are really you know struggling deep time will allow them to find an artifact which shows perhaps elves and dwarves at peace sharing a drink together Oh, that was oh, that was eons ago when the uh, elves and dwarves were united against the Orcish Empire. Well, once the orcs were defeated, of course, the elves turned on the dwarves, and the dwarves turned on the elves. Oh, those were better times. So you can use your deep time to create different eras, different feelings in your game. So I often use that to counterpoint. It's like, well, the elves were once allies, now they're enemies. The Klingons were enemies, now they're allies. That's not so much deep time, although that was 100 years in certain iterations of Star Trek. So you can do definitely for that. Make it grander, make it bigger. Why not? If the current empire is huge, make an older empire even bigger. We see that often in science fiction games where, oh, well, that was the Takon Empire. No, they spanned three or four universes. They didn't just bother with galaxies. They were universal empires. These were truly, truly, truly spectacularly large organizations, but they collapsed. They collapsed. We don't know why. Don't know about the technology. It was all self-destructing. You know, they prevented other races from getting all that kind of stuff. So you can make it grander, make it feel bigger because it's, it's epic. It's deep time. You have no risk of anything from that period coming back unless you want it to. And then make the fall interesting. If your players, for example, are perhaps being a little bit difficult, maybe they are murder hobos, maybe they're trying to kill everything that they come across, have them come across a legend of the fall of one of these empires because the king of this empire rather killed people than spoke to them. That was his whole thing. And as a result, he was eventually beheaded by his people who got tired of his same old, same old, same old. So you could use it as a, a little bit, a little bit of a warning something that the players could pick up on and go hmm, okay so they killed him were they happier afterwards yes they were yes they were they might not pick up on that but you could use it as that so there's different ways in which you can make your deep time even more interesting and more useful to you not just from an adventure hook perspective but from a game control and a perspective positioning i think and that's really 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 useful something to bear in mind until next time, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of campaign creation.